Romans chapter number 2. I trust in God here as always, but um, came I thought with a different direction, but uh, he's pricked my heart quickly. Romans chapter number 2, verse number 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do, this, do such things, and do the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his good goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render it to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Just stop right there. Father, we pray that you would open your word to our hearts. May it convict us. May it show us exactly where we are. And may we as your people surrender to its truth. We recognize, God, that you are true. And yet every man a liar. Help us to see this clearly. Help us to understand that we cannot, Lord, in one way expect mercy and yet not give it. We cannot receive forgiveness and yet not also forgive. Help us in this truth to be what you've asked us to be. Make us right. Help us as we've come before you broken, recognizing truth among us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible tells of a woman whose reputation had preceded her. Not only was it... um, in, at least in that day, culturally unacceptable for a woman to enter into the room of a bunch of men. But this woman's reputation was one of ill repute. A woman certainly that had had a, a great deal of indiscretion attached to her life, likely was guilty in every way, but aren't we all? I'm grateful today that in spite of myself, Jesus loves me. I've never been worthy of the the very grace and mercy that he's extended. And yet it was the blood of Christ at Calvary that paid the way for a sinner to go free at all. What the Bible teaches us in the book of Romans is that it was because of the sin of Adam, the very offense and separation from God that took place in the Garden of Eden that that same sin was passed down. You say, well, I'm not guilty of the sin of Adam. Well, I would dispute that with you, but that's not the point. The point is, is that God chose. God chose to make every man guilty because Adam was guilty. Because God was able to put every man under sin uh, through the sins of one man. He was also then able by the grace of one man to save all. And it was God's goodness that did that, you see. It wasn't because you and I were good, and it wasn't because we were sinless. Of every sort, we're sinners. There's none of us that are free of sin. None of us whose mind is free and clear of the burden and and, and the corruption of the sin nature that abides within our own hearts. We're all sinners. And because of this, God was able, before the beginning of time, he was uh, already able to conclude that all are under sin so that he might send his son and one man dying for the sin was able to forgive for him. And yet, we find ourselves 
often giving excuse. We find ourselves trying to justify how we are versus how someone else is. This woman walked into the room that day with one thing on her mind. Now, there was everybody else in that room that thought something else. There was everybody else that was trying to figure this woman out, and so many of them wished that she had never come in. Right, And that's what that song was about. Right, If you're not careful, you sit under the steeple of God and you look down your nose at somebody else as if uh, you're better than they are. What we know about that, amen, is that there is none good, no, not one. There's not any of us that have ever had the right or merited even lifting our head before the holy God who has brought salvation to us and yet here we have an opportunity uh, to look and recognize that what God does for one, he does for all. And that it's not God's will that any man should perish. How many men? Any should perish. But that they come to Repentance. Now, I don't control whether a man or a woman gets right with God, but I can tell you this, it's not the will of God that they live in the miserable condition of a sinner. If he'd save you, he'll save anybody. God's good. And what we find is that the mercies of God and the goodness of God remind us of how awful we are, how much of a sinner that we are. And I'm grateful to God. I don't know the motive of any man's heart, but they didn't know the woman's heart for sure. Because when she began to do what she did, they were filled with indignation. You say, why in the world would they have condemned this woman for coming into the room and breaking a box of ointment, pouring it on the head of Jesus, weeping at his feet, washing his feet with the hairs of her head and the tears from her eyes? How in the world could they look at the offering, the sacrifice that this woman and saw anything but exactly what Jesus deserved and that was praise? And yet they did. Jesus knew it. Jesus knew it. He, oh, Simon, who had invited him into his house, Simon, the proud of heart, the one Pharisee, thinking himself able or more able than others, thinking himself better than others, thought to himself, why, if he knew what kind of woman this was, he surely would have sent her away. But what he didn't understand about Jesus was that's exactly the kind of woman he came to save. Aren't you glad of that? Amen, Amen, that God didn't come to save or to heal those that were already holy. He came for the sick. He came for the perverted. He came for the demented. He came for the worthless. He came for the unlovable. Thanks be unto God, he came for the sinner. Of the apostle Paul of saying, of whom I am chief. If ever there was a hero, it's mine, Amen. And yet he was being clear that he considered himself the chief of all sinners. He recognized that his past was spotted with those indiscretions of hate. See, that's what motivated Paul, Saul, as he went from town to town torturing, enslaving, and in some cases murdering people in the name of God. He did it thinking that he was doing God a favor. He did it with an indignation. He thought righteous, but it was wicked and it was ungodly. And it looked in the eyes of another man and judged them without even the ability to see truly in the heart of a human being. And yet all of us find ourselves in the same place. And that's why he addressed it in Romans chapter number two. And he made it absolutely clear that there's not one of us that can excuse ourselves when we're found guilty of judging the heart of another. Now, I'm not condoning sin. I'll tell you right now, if you've got sin in your life, you better get right. Because my God is holy, he is righteous, he is perfect in every way, his wrath and his judgment are sure, and it is based upon truth. You mark my words, if you're living in sin, you will answer to my God, you will answer to his wrath, you will answer to his judgment. But I can also assure you of this, that God came to save sinners, of whom I am chief. This woman walked in, and I know she had a past, right? Everyone knew. Now, I'm not going to get into how they knew so intimately about her spotted past. 
But I will tell you this, that when she walked in the room, it took courage for her to come in there. And when she came in there, she came in on purpose. Right? She came in knowing that she was going to be scorned. She came in knowing that she was going to be judged. She came in knowing that it was, it was in opposition to everything she wanted to do in the place. But she obeyed God and she worshiped the Lord Jesus by washing his feet with the hairs of her head and the tears of her broken heart. Jesus, knowing the heart of Simon, the Pharisee, he said, Simon, he said, I've got something to share with you. He said, say on. And Jesus began to tell him a story. He said, there was a couple of men that owed this fellow a lot of stuff. And one of them owed him 50 and the other owed him 500. When it come time to settle up their debts, neither one of them could pay. May I say to you today, that whether your sins you think are few compared to the sins of someone else that are many, I want you to know today that when it comes to time to settle up with God, you can't pay for them. I don't care if they're one or if they're a million, you cannot pay for your sin. You've never been able to pay for your sin. You're in the hand of a merciful God alone and it is by his forgiveness that any sin is forgiven. So whether it's 50 or whether it's 500, the point is, is you can't pay it. You are unable to pay for your sin debt. Hence the very purpose for Christ himself anyway. He said to the, the Pharisee, he said one owed this and the other owed this great amount and when it come time to pay, he said neither one of them could pay. And the Bible said that the king frankly forgave them both. Are anybody glad for that? The king forgave them both. Now some of you were saved as a child, maybe being reared in church and taught of God and, and you found him, amen, I found him at nine years old. I don't know how much bad I'd done up to that point, but I can tell you right now, he found me, amen, and when he found me, I became a sinner. I recognized my sin. You couldn't have convinced me at that moment in time that there was anybody in this world that was any more deserving of hell. I recognized it. I knew that not because of my own intellect or doctrinal raising. What I knew was by the Holy Spirit that I needed God to save me. Amen. Now, I was just as lost as a man could be at nine years old. Amen. You can take that for what it's worth, but that's the truth. He said he forgave them both. Forgave them both. Then he asked Simon a question. He said, now, he said, which of the two of those do you think loved him the most after that? Now, what he was doing was clearly making an example of this woman who was at his feet. This woman who, under the ridicule and the eyes of all of these others, was bowed at his feet and she was weeping, uncontrollably weeping, on the feet of Jesus, and I can see in my own mind the dirt trails on his dusty feet as her tears began to just pour over them. And as she kept her eyes on the feet of Jesus, she made sure, friend, that every drop that fell made its mark, that it found the place, because she came into that place for one reason, and that was to worship God. I can't establish the motive in anybody's heart, the agenda in anybody's mind, but here's what I can tell you. If you've come for any other reason than to exalt and to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. You better be careful because thou art inexcusable, old man. The man that puts him in a place to judge somebody else, puts him in a position to look down at the life of someone else. Here's what I know, that except it's for the grace of an almighty God, we're all going to hell. Amen. We're all lost without God. Amen. We have no hope at all except it be for Jesus Christ. This woman came in that place with an intent in her heart. I don't know your motive, but I do know hers. When she went in there, her very desire was to leave there with nothing left. She broke that box in one gospel. You'll find that it was a precious 
ointment contained in that alabaster box and when she broke it friend I don't believe she lifted a lid she broke the thing intending to make certain that everything she had was poured out on the Lord now in that circumstance you'll find that even Judas right he was over there in his greedy heart according to the apostle John John just called him a thief he said his problem was he is a thief from the beginning when he saw the waste, the extravagance of her sacrifice, he thought to himself, well, this could have been sold for 300 pence and give to the poor. John understood his motive in the end. He said he didn't want the 300 pence for the poor. He wanted it so he could put it in the bag that he carried because he was a thief. Let me say something to you today. When you look down your nose at somebody else, you better be careful because it's likely a mirror that you're looking in. There's not anybody that I have ever met or will ever meet that can say to me they are sinless, they are holy, they are righteous apart from the work of Jesus Christ in them. There is nothing good about me, nothing good about you. There is nothing good about anybody. We stand today because the Lord Jesus Christ forgave us of our sins sins and lives within us I listened to a song several times this week actually and I actually watched watched the video on on YouTube and I watched it two or three times and I thought to myself man what an indictment on people of faith people that are to love the sinner to love the outcast of the world Does anybody see her? Does anybody hear her? Does anybody know that she's going down today? Under the shadow of the steeple. Of these high and lofty people. Does anybody know that the sinner is going down? Does anybody care? the soul of another human being is in that close proximity to the truth of Jesus Christ and the loving words of a Savior who died on a cross and said quite clearly, Father, forgive them. Who are you talking about all? The one, the only one who has ever had a right to say anything but that said that. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This poor woman, when she came in there, yes, was her reputation destroyed likely. I don't know how it got rebuilt, but I can tell you right now, when I think about her, it's been restored, if you know what I mean. She knows what I know, amen, that when he came to me, he found something that was unlovable, found something that was unhelpable, found something that he loved enough to die for. And may I say to you today, I give him the praise for that. I bow before you as humble as I know how. And I serve you today with a grateful heart that he'll just let me be a part of this. I'm glad today that Jesus loves the sinner that when he looks at me, he doesn't look at what I was because he paid for that and my sins are all gone. I stand before you today in my very heart clean. Not because I'm good, but because the effect efficacy of the of the blood of Jesus Christ is perfect the propitiation that was made for my soul was absolute and forever When he saved me, he made me his own. He bought me with that price and I am not my own anymore. Now, we can go about this life thinking that somehow that has set us up uh, to be different than any others. But what the Lord said to them in the book of Romans was is that you were also sometimes these that were alienated, these that were darkened in their minds against God, these that had lived in abomination and all of the wicked of this life he said you were just like them you were just like them but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners bless his name somebody help me bless his holy name 
While we were yet sinners, the glorious Lamb, the Holy God, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, He died for my sin. Bless His holy name. Glory to His holy name that He'd love a sinner. And yet Paul, speaking to the Roman Jews, was clear. Speaking to the Roman Gentile, he was clear. He said that thou that judgest another, he said be careful. Because in the very thing that you judge of another person, he said you condemn your own self up. We condemn our own selves when we take up the position of the Almighty. That's what we're doing, you see. When we assume in our heart to be able to examine the mode of our agenda or the heart or the condition of any other human being, we have put ourselves, established ourselves on a throne, and we looking down have, have given ourselves some kind of innate ability to establish whether a person is right or wrong with God. May I say to you today, you're inexcusable when you live like that. You're inexcusable when you see yourself in that condition. It's hypocrisy at its basest form. It's the vilest and most wretched thing that I could ever do is to lift myself up into a place where God is. Because I can assure you the only one capable of judging any human correctly is God. None of us. None of us have the right or the ability to establish need in somebody else's heart. Here's what I can tell you. If, if we condemn another person, right, you may have known them. You may have seen what they did last night. You may have heard what it was they did last week or what they said or, or how they acted. You may have recognized and lined up with the word of God that it was vile, that it was wretched, that it was hateful, that it was ungodly, all of these things. None of them are condoned by God. But let me be clear, he didn't put me in the position of judge and I've only one hope and that's he forgives me, that he is merciful to me, that he is patient to me and what I need to do according to the word of God is when I see my sister in a ditch when I see my brother in a ditch is to get down in the ditch with them and to help them that are weak to support them that are weak to love them in a way that they understand that the Lord Jesus wants them to be right with him does anybody hear does anybody see does anybody recognize that she's going down today? Being born again, I can tell you, is the most wondrous and awesome thing that a person will ever experience in this world. Being a part of the family of God and the fellowship of Christ affords me a great deal of blessing. And I'll, I'll be the first to tell you that he favors me he favors me. You say, why, well, you're special. No, that ain't why he favors me. As a matter of fact, there's some among us that we'd call special. Them that can't fend for themselves. Them who are willing to recognize and admit that they can't do anything without God. You talking about special? That's the kind of special I am. I can't make it out that door without the help of the Lord Jesus. You better thank God, Christian friend, brother or sister. In Christ. You better thank God he made the Holy Spirit live in you. Because huh? if that wasn't his plan, he'd have done left. He'd have done wandered off from you. He'd have done, he'd done put you in the bucket with the rest of the unlovables of this world. The Lord Jesus Christ loves you and the Holy Spirit abides with you and will never leave you. Right. 
Now, that's what this woman recognized. And when she came in there, she didn't come in there caring about what they thought. She didn't come in there worried about their condemnation or their judgment. Amen. She went in there bravely and she bowed down at his feet. And I don't believe she ever lifted her head. She just wept and wept. The Bible said at one point she kissed his feet. Oh, to God that we could get down and kiss his feet. Huh. You say, what a nasty thought. I'm going to tell you right now, if that doesn't appeal to you, you better get right with God. Huh? If that doesn't strike a chord in your heart and say, whoo, I'd like to do that. Hey, man, I'm telling you right now, you need to get your heart right with God. If you don't right now want to bow down at his feet and kiss that dirt off of him, if you ain't in the place that you recognize that he miraculously rescued you from the pit, then you're in danger of living up there somewhere on a pedestal like a Pharisee looking down your nose at somebody who's probably more right than you are. This woman, when she went in there, she went in on purpose. I don't know exactly what the disciples were thinking. It exposed Simon the Pharisee quite clearly about his judgment. But I believe Simon the Pharisee was in all the while looking from a different frame of reference. See, I don't believe he was any more holy than that woman was the day before Jesus found her. Right? He just thought he was. See, the problem with a lot of people, and I can tell you, most of the judgment comes from souls that ain't never been regenerated. They looking down their nose thinking that they somehow have, have, have earned the right into his book when all the while they ain't never been put in it. You ever get a clear reference of who you are in relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't be looking around. Amen, you'll be looking down or you'll be looking to him. That's the only direction because ain't none of us deserved to be saved. None of us. There's dope addicts, sex addicts. There's all kinds of evil all around us. May I say to you today, they have every right to heaven and the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ that I did. Not one of them could I put myself beside and say, well, I earned it more than him or I deserved it more than her. You hear me? You are a sinner just like me. Regardless of what your addiction was, I can assure you this, you were bound for the pit, you were bound for the flames of hell and the torments of that place will find you as a wicked alien of God. You will never know the joy of heaven. You will never know eternal life unless you get born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. And until you get born again, you'll continue to fight that. And even when you get born again, you're gonna have to keep in check where you came from, amen? It doesn't take me long to figure it out. You go back to the moment I got saved and I was helpless, hopeless, and he saved me. He saved me. Throughout the word of God, you'll find multiple examples of righteous indignation or perceived righteous indignation by individuals who thought themselves better than others. The Old Testament's full of it, right? Israel from its inception thought they were better than everybody else in the world. All the while, God from the very beginning, Travis, from the very beginning, he told Moses, he said, I don't care if it's your servant. He said, if they'll be circumcised and follow my commandments, he said, they'll be an Israelite. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's every one of us in this room. We became a child of the living God. You know how? We got grafted in. Amen. It ain't Jewish blood running through our veins. We were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. We had no hope and we were without God in this world. Amen. That's exactly how every one of us were. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Died for me. I ain't got any more right to sit in a position of judgment toward another soul. Now I can pity you and do. 
because I have compassion. As a child of God, he put something inside me that I can't scrub out. That's his love. He makes me love everybody. When I look at a soul that's bound by the trouble of this world, bound by the sin of their own lives, bound by the wicked snares of an enemy who desires to destroy and steal their very peace, I can pity them and do. I can pray for them in that compassion and brokenness of my own spirit. Because here's what I can tell you. If you don't turn to God, you're going to hell. And I pity you. I pity your poor soul. Because you don't have to go to hell. You ain't no worse than I was. The Lamb of God came to save you. Bless your heart, he did save me. I can't speak for nobody else, but he saved me. And I get to go to heaven, not of one good thing that I have done. Nothing but the blood is going to get me there. Nothing will get me in. I have no right to look at another person and justify myself in holding a grudge or an ought or an offense. None. This is some godly pastoral advice. If you've got something against somebody, you better get right. Because God don't accept it. Don't allow it. Don't condone it. Thou art inexcusable. If you stand and place yourself in judgment of another person, thou art inexcusable. He said to Simon, I'll close with this. He told Simon that simple story. One man owed him 50, the other owed him 500. When it come time to pay, neither one of them could pay, and the king forgave both of them. He said, Simon, he said, which of these two do you think loved him the most? Well, Simon gave him the most logical and rational answer, right? Every one of us would have gave the same answer. We'd say, why, the one he forgave the most, that's the one that's going to love him the most. And you know what Jesus said to him? He said, you're right. He said, since I come in your house, he said, you didn't give me no kiss. You didn't show not one means of affection for me. And yet this woman said, she's come in here, she ain't ceased to kiss my feet. She ain't stopped kissing my feet. I thought to myself, how embarrassing to have a woman kissing your feet. Jesus didn't say a thing. He just let her kiss and weep and let her hair down, just washed. Kept on a weep, kept on a kiss. <laughs> Which one are you? Are you the woman or are you the Pharisee? I can tell you who I want to be. I don't deserve to be no higher than this. No, when it comes time to worship in the house of God, I want to be, I want to be the one like this. Weeping over his feet. She wasn't worried about anybody in that room but Christ. And you know why? Because she loved him so. She was so lost. She was so vile. She was so wretched. And yet one day he passed by her. And he cast out all them demons. He cast out all her past. He forgave her. And brother, when she came in the house that day, she had but one thing to give, and that was to pour it all out to Christ. Verse number four. Or despisest thou? the riches of his goodness 
You, you think, oh man, that, that judge somebody else that, that does these things, that, that you're not guilty of the same thing. He said, thou shalt, you think that you'll escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. I'm going to ask him to get a song. The responsibility today of every believer is to look into the highways and the hedges which they live and to recognize that there are human souls that Jesus Christ died for that are out there. Are they messed up? Yeah, just like you were. Are they addicted to things that are, that are of this world? Yes, just like you were. Are they unlovable most of the time? Yes, just like you were. Unworthy? Of the, of the sacrifice that was, yes, just like you were. Every one of us had the wondrous opportunity to be able to serve someone else that was just like us and let them know that Jesus loves you too. He loves you too. I, I, the first time I'd ever heard that song, sister, I, but, but there was something about the first church of mercy. There ain't a person in this room that has a right to be anything but merciful to another because it was his extreme mercy that rescued you. We have opportunities every day to love people like Jesus loved us. And that was in spite of, we've got opportunities every day to love in a way that compels a sinner to come to God, right? Because here's what I can assure you. We were all sinners. If you've got a need of God today, I'm going to ask you to repent. Get right with God. I hope. I hope, if nothing else, the goodness of God today is going to lead you to a place of true repentance where you'll say to God, I'm sorry. I've wronged you. I've wronged them. I've wronged her. I've wronged him. I, I'm, I want to get right with you because here's what I know. I don't have any hope apart from Christ. As we say, would you stand today?
I was 19 years old and I had a little boy. And I don't tell this very often because it's, it's my testimony and it's really personal. But what you think of me has nothing to do with who I am before God. Because God used that situation and my broken heart to draw me to Him. And I was by myself when I got saved because God knew that if I was in a church and I was sitting there listening to a preacher, I would have refuted Him and I would have turned away because God loved me that much. He came to me when I was alone and told me, you need this. And where I was at, at the very bottom, I had nothing to give. But I recognized that the void that I had within myself, that I had been searching to fill so desperately, running from one person to the next, from one drug to the next thing, that none of it would work because it was God alone that would fix what was wrong with me. And that was sin. And you have a need. You have a need. Each of us have a need of God. Amen. And it's like I said this morning, you know what? All the children of Israel that left Egypt, they were all lost. And they all suffered different things at the hands of the Egyptian and probably at the hands of each other. But the redemption that God brought them when they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground, the redemption was the same for all of them. And in the same way that I got saved through the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart. See, I thought people were absolute lunatics when they said that they heard the voice of God because I didn't believe it. Until I heard Him speak. And when you hear God speak to your heart, you will recognize Him. Because His voice is unlike anything else you've ever heard. And it is the sweetest voice. Even in those times when hellfire and brimstone are falling around you. When you think you're going to die and go to hell, that sweet voice reaches out to you and extends grace to you. And draws you in. And I'm begging you, if you hear Him speaking to you and you need to be saved, today is the day. And nobody here is going to look down on you. I know it for a fact. Because we have all been where you are. Today is the day of salvation. There's no better time than right now. Because if you look around you, it's not getting better. And it's not going to get better. So you have to have something that will not change. Amen. I don't want to sing this song. I'll be honest with you, I don't. Because I'm not good at it. But I know what God asked me to do. And I want to be obedient to Him. Even if I mess it up, I don't care. Because what y'all think, it doesn't matter. What matters is that I'm obeying Him. So please pray for me. Because this is my testimony. Because He loves me. And He wanted me and he cared for me in a way that no one else could. Try. So if you hear him, please come to him because he loves you more than you can ever Amen. know. And he gave the very best that he had for you. 